I want to use what we did yesterday with Shemaradi's regularity lemma to complete the proof of large deviation for random graphs and then use it to derive some results and says about uh, number of triangles in random graphs and so on. So let's recall what the space is and what we are concerned with. You are having the space of symmetric functions and the square that lie between 0 and 1. The topology on x is the one induced by the cut metric and here is the cut metric. It is also equivalent to this object. T is a measure measure preserving transformation of the unit interval into itself. It acts on x by mapping any function f x y. x and y get transformed to t x and t y. The important thing to note is there is the same t that operates on both sides. And the cut metric has the property that d of t of t g is the same as d of f g. The metric itself is invariant under the transformation group. If you look at something like weak topology, this will not be true. But it is true in the, for the cut topology. So, it forms a group S and we declare two elements to be equivalent if g is in the closure of S f. The orbit itself may not be closed, so you close the orbit and an element is g is equal to f if g is in the closure of the orbit. Okay, one still has to prove now that if g is in the closure of the orbit of f, then f is in the closure of the orbit of g. That requires a little bit of an argument to convince yourself it is true. And one can check it, it is not that difficult. Uh, you know, if f is in the orbit of g, there is something along the orbit which is very close, then pull both of them back, and then this will be close to that. It is just uh, that you can do that because the metric is invariant under the group action. So the Gaussian space is x modulo this equivalence relation. And then you have the entropy function, which is this object. It's, this is actually a double integral from 0 to 1, 0 to 1. And h is invariant under the action by s, because it is basically an integral and you make the measure pressing transformation, the integrals do not change. Now, the lower semi continuity implies that f is equal to g, then we want to conclude that it, it, the value of f does not change on the orbit. That requires again a little bit of a thought because in along the orbit it is ok, it is invariant, but then when you take the limit it may drop because it is only lower semi-continuous. So, what if there are points in the orbit where it drops? Well, it cannot be because you can reverse the argument. We said if f is equal to g, g is equal to f. So, so you get an inequality that f and g are equivalent. h of f is less than or equal to h of g and h of g is less than or equal to h of f because it is a symmetric relationship and so actually the h is a constant on the full orbit. And you can pull it back and the lower semi-continuity tells you h of g is less than or equal to h of f. By symmetry you have the other side. Now y is compact and this is what 
would come from Shimonides' regularity. So let's go through that. So you take a collection of functions f of x, y. For each l, the unit interval is divided into l plus 1 subintervals, j0 through jl plus 1. l of them are equal length, and the last one is of length at most epsilon. Consider the set of functions which are some constants p, i, j between 0 and 1 on all these things and extend it by 0 on the exceptional interval. So basically what we are doing is we are chopping up the unit square So there is a little piece here, and then the rest of it chopped into equal sizes. And you put some arbitrary values p, a, j here between 0 and 1. So these set of functions are a collection of simple functions on a finite grid lying between 0 and 1. And it is definitely compact set in L1. It is a compact set in uh, any space you want. And you, so it can be covered so it's compact in every topology you want. So for each epsilon greater than zero I consider the collection of these things as L varies, but a finite collection. The finite collection may depend upon epsilon, so it is L varying from C1 epsilon to C2 epsilon. And this is a compact set gamma epsilon. And a finite collection of this radius epsilon in the cut topology will cover this. Because it's a compact set, can be covered by a finite number of disks. Shamanadi's lemma says, for any graph on n vertices, there is a label, i.e. there is a permutation, that will bring it to an epsilon neighborhood in the cut topology to one of these disks. Okay. That's really the content of Shamanadi's lemma, although it's stated differently, So there is a count of edges in each box and you can compute the ratio. So there is actual some numbers that are computable from the graph. How many edges are there between the ith cell and the jth cell. Shemerity okay. says for most of the blocks, if you take any small portion here, the anything which is not so small, the ratios would still be the same. That's what the lemma says. So if you want to show that you want to you want to compare it to something, okay. So the actual numbers are 0 to 1. So when you compute E cross F, something like this, in this block here, there may be some good cells, there may be some bad cells. Okay. The bad cells are small proportion of the number of cells. And the good cells, the ratio is basically the same. So this if you compute this ratio, okay, 
And you know, no matter how it intersects all these cells, that would represent basically very close to what you had before. Right? Let's pursue this a little more. So another way of saying it is that if you look at all these things and look at epsilon neighborhood of these things and you take the orbit of that, that will include all the graphs. Because any graph can be brought into the epsilon neighborhood of this. That's the content of Shemaridhi's lemma. Okay. So what it's saying is that the space well first of all I want to so what okay, let's see what this really says. If you look at these disks there are here a finite number of disks and if you look at the orbit of these that covers all graphs. Okay. You have a frown on your face. Okay. Because each graph is some complicated graph on chopped up into very small pieces. But these are some big pieces in respect to that as graphons, they are in the orbits they are close. To some of them. I don't know which one. There is one thing that I can always find. So these are disks of size epsilon in the quotient space because these are orbits full by n factorial elements but still is an orbit. So these are orbits of disks of size epsilon. So the disks of size epsilon in the quotient space y. So what I'm shown now, if you look at all the graphs that you will get all the graphons you will get from any graph that can be covered by a finite number of disks. Of radius epsilon for every epsilon. That tells you that the at least those that come from graphs, they can be covered by a finite number. Next, you have to convince yourself that those that come from graphs are dense. Okay? If that's so, if you take epsilon, replace it by two epsilon, then it will cover those two. Okay? And then that will make the space y totally bounded. And then you have to check that the space is complete if it's complete and totally bounded, then it's compact. That's the way the argument is going to go. So, why, how do you show that the closure of all the graphons coming from actual graphs is everything? That means, given any function f, which is a graph form, I want to construct a sequence of graphs which converges to that in the space of graph forms. Okay. That's actually very simple because first you look at this f, it's after all a measurable function, it can be approximated by some function g in L1 topology so that g is nice, continuous. So you have a continuous G. 
then you can chop up the space into a finite number of grid such that the oscillation of G is small here. some constants here, C1 and so on. So I have no control on the number here except it's finite at this point. Uh, absolutely no control. Okay. Then I can chop it up further even into much, much larger number of pieces and then make random choices of zeros and ones according to whatever number there is. So make Bernoulli choices for each of these things. Okay. So I can divide this up as nicely as I want so that my large large number is Bernoulli is valid to a high degree of accuracy so that when I sum it up over all these pieces here doesn't make any difference. Okay. So a lot of, you know, just chopping and chopping and chopping makes it more and more accurate since the Shemarady lemma does not depend on n. I have essentially the choice of making n infinite so that nothing is random, but I can't say that in words, so I have to make n very, very large. So what we are now is, we, so, this, so the next step is to show that the space is complete. Okay, what does that mean? It's true that the full square size is uncontrollable, but you know what it is. And you're going to make the small squares after you looked at how, many, how much accuracy you need. We have finite number of disks of size 3 epsilon for any epsilon greater than 0. So y is totally bounded. Because y is complete. Get a subsequence so that the successive differences are less than 2 to the minus n. You can always sample like that. Okay. Track it with fn such that fn, fn plus 1 is less than twice 2 to the minus n. Right? Since so the successive differences are small, that means once you are here, there is something along the orbit here which is close. But you give yourself twice the error, rather actually one which is, you don't have to go into the closure of the orbit. So you actually have a sequence of graphons so with this property. Then since the space of graphons is complete, I'm not in the equivalence class now, actual graphons, this is complete. And once you have a subsequence that converges, uh, you have a Cauchy sequence, then everything converges. So the space is complete, and so you have a totally bounded complete space which is compact. So now, how do we get the upper bound? For a small ball, one gets the upper bound by Chebyshev's inequality and we get the right trait function. Because you see, if you, the idea is whenever you have a small, we went through that last time, whenever you have just a small ball, it's just one point. You want to get probability essentially at one point more or less. 
you can get the upper bound from probability of any half space by evaluating expectation of the exponential of the linear functional, which we can do by Chebyshev, you get all those bounds and then you optimize over it. That gives you the Legendre transform of the log of the moment generating function. And for the uh, Bernoulli case, and we have computed it, so it's the standard function. Okay. Any cut neighborhood contained in a weak neighborhood, so any estimate you get from the weak topology is good for a cut neighborhood. The only trouble is you can't string the neighborhoods together. But you can do it in the quotient space. Okay. But the quotient space is you don't have an estimate on the neighborhood far because you see when you have originally you have estimated a ball like this. When you take an orbit in the quotient space, it's that. And this length is infinite because it's the measure pursuing transformations the yield interval. So you need to get the probability for this whole thing and not just for this little block. Once you get the estimate for this whole thing, then compactness will take over and you will get a prob upper large deviation upper bound. Yeah. Now of course, you know this is continuum. Okay. If it were discrete, You can just count how many, and since these are all measure preserving, you would have exactly the same bond for each one, okay, and it will be done. And the idea is you can essentially do it by n factorial, okay. And once we know that it can be done by n factorial then what we estimate we get would be n factorial times the estimate we get for this. But the estimate we get here are e to the minus something times n square. And n factorial is only e to the n log n. And n square beats n log n. So n factorial means nothing. Again, like everything here, you need to use Shemeridis lemma for this. We saw earlier that there is a finite number of disks dj epsilon. For any n permuted suitably, is represented by a function in this union of all these disks. The orbit of k epsilon by the permutation group of size n factorial covers all of y. And because anything you start something in the permutation group brings an inside. So if you take this and to add all the permutations of this, you only need to use those permutations that brought you in to take you out. So they are only n factorial in number. So there are n factorial permutations of this which cover all of y. Not all of y, the alone part of y where the measure is concentrated, that's all you care about. Namely the graphons that come from the graph. And 
they're just a fi- you know they're just a finite number, and you can express the measure of this as n factorial times the measure of that. finite number of disks that, that cover k epsilon and you take one and you estimate this object they do not intersect there is nothing to do zero if they intersect then g belongs to three epsilon so basically h of g then is very close to h of f and LDP bound for DG epsilon is enough. So there's a little approximation that you need to do. Everything is small perturbation of the disk. So the fact that by n factorial permutation, you can bring everything to be inside the class of graphons of a compact, essentially a compact set of graphons, allows you to complete the argument. Well, we look at the triangle count. This is the number in our random graph. <coughs> number of triangles in our random graph. The expectation is roughly n cubed, p cubed by 6. And you can compute this object. Now, it's and if t is bigger than p cubed by, one must assume t is bigger than p cubed by six. Otherwise, this is zero because there is probability d k is only if t is big. Okay. The way to compute IPT is you minimize the entropy subject to the condition that the triangle count is right. The triangle count is one-sixth of this. So for the triangle count to come out right, you need this to be 60, and the entropy is actually one half of uh, f log f plus one minus f log f, because it's only over a triangle that there is noise. The other half of the square is just reflection. Or if you want it to be full, you have to normalize by n squared by 2 rather than by n squared, it's whichever way you do it. So that's the HPF. Okay. So there are some interesting things in this variational problem you can do. For p, you know, if your t is very close to p cubed by 6, so you're only looking for a slight extension, okay, slightly large number of triangles, you can actually compute that explicitly. And what it comes from is having the probability of having an edge instead of p something slightly higher. You take uh, 60 to the one third, call that your new p prime, and p prime will be bigger than p. 
So it's really the Bernoulli entropy of entropy of Bernoulli P prime with respect to Bernoulli P. Okay. That's only true when your deviation you want is fairly small. Pretty soon it changes because it's no longer inexpensive to put more edges in. It's better to actually uh, club them to the form clicks. So you take a small number of edges and concentrate them in a part of the graph. That will produce more triangles. So there are two alternate mechanisms for producing more triangles. And initially, it's one mechanism that's economically advantageous. After a certain stage, there's a phase transition. And the other one becomes more advantageous. And then when you increase more, then it goes back to the earlier one because that becomes more advantageous. So it just changes its mind a couple of times. And on the lower side, if you don't want, if you want fewer triangles, the graph tries to be bipartite. So it can have then actually n by 2, n, by, uh, n square by 4 edges without having a single triangle. Okay. Those are the kind of things that one could do by trying to do the variational problem here. Okay, let's see. Explicitly find the F. What? You explicitly find the F which will for the triangle comes. For nearby. Yeah. It's a it's just a constant, right? All you need to do is that this is a constant. Anything that's a constant is easy to find. You have to know it's a constant and you have to prove it's a constant. Actually, there are some nice results. I'll come back to that in a second. So, and this really needs an argument. The argument should be that it's strictly increasing because when you compute these things, uh, because they're equal to tn square, uh, you, want, you, you end up by conditioning to be equal to t. So that requires that somehow that the rate is strictly increasing. If there is a flat spot, then the calculations are not quite correct. So first thing one needs to prove is that that infimum or this limit is strictly increasing in T. So here is an inequality. If T is smaller than S, IPT is less than T over S to the one third times IPS. Tells you it, it decreases by a definite amount. Provided they are not all zero, it's easy to check that it's not all zero. So one choice of choosing the number of triangles is choose the Bernoulli with p equals 60 to the one half. That gives a function hp had t is equal to hp 60 to the one third. One compares the f with the f delta with 1 minus delta f plus delta p. That's another admissible choice. It's a mixture. So in other words, I am perturbing. F by mixing it a little bit with P. And for the perturbation, I want to compute the triangle and the entropy in terms of the triangle and the entropy for F.
So you pick any f such that its entropy very close to the minimum and the triangle count is near, very close to s and then I'm going to pick delta such that 1 minus delta cubed is t over s and then mix it and see what happens. Then entropy is convex. Okay. So it's so it's less than or equal to the combination outside, the linear combination outside. The, for, the, for P, the entropy is zero because that's actually the mean. So you get one minus delta times this entropy plus delta times zero, which goes away, and one minus delta was T over S to the one third uh, times HP if I left out, sorry. Oops, there should be a HPF multiplying here. And you can compute what T of F delta is. You know, it's 1 minus delta F plus delta multiplied by 3 times and integrated. Forget about all the deltas, just take 1 minus f, the 1 minus delta times f and integrate that. And that gives you 1 minus delta cube tf. And that's t. So, you know, you are able to get to t by an entropy that's t minus t over s to the one third. And that's the, see by mixing, you reduce by, by mixing, you reduce the tri triangle count slightly, you reduce the entropy slightly, but, but you can adjust it so that you lose the triangle count by just the amount you want, but the entropy loss is definitely there. Okay, that's the argument. The function 60, 60 to the one third HP need not be convex, although HPT is convex. Okay, so a candidate for a rate function is this, because that's what your P is, 60 to the one third. Okay. So let's call HPT hat convex minor rent. So the HPT is something, I don't know, it's something like that maybe. And you look at a convex minor rent of that, that's below it. Suppose they touch at some point. Then the optimizer is x60 to the one third is the correct optimizer. So if you condition the number of triangles to be t, the graph will look like a Bernoulli graph on with probability 60 to the one third. Yeah, because this is the unique minimizer, so the entire measure concentrates their standard large deviation theory. Okay. So, how do we prove that? So it's good to draw a picture here.
Here is the function h of 60 to the one thirds. Here is the convex minor end of this. And they touch at some point. Maybe they touch all the way here, all through, and at this point they depart. Anyway, there's a point where they touch, and you draw a tangent here. So the, at this point, three curves come together. The tangent line the function h and then let's say h hat t which is the convex minor end. And this is bigger than, well, I should write it in the wrong order. This is bigger than h hat t. Uh, this is less than or equal to Yeah, I guess it's correct. This is less than or equal to HP. Uh, no, H hat here, second one in the middle. And that's less than or equal to HPT. That's the order in which they are. But at that point, they're all the same. And also, let's call it X here. So you look at a x plus b minus you minimize you maximize with respect to x the argument that maximizes it is t for all for both of them because that's that's where they touch and they don't they're all about the curve. And for the arg max arguments I don't need the B, I can drop the B out. It's just a constant. Doesn't matter. Okay. Now let C T be the function identically equal to 60 to the one thirds. Then you compute A T minus H P of C T. T is just a constant and C T is the function 60 to the one thirds. You raise it to the third power, you get 60 divided by 6, you get T. So this is just t represented in a complicated manner. And that is HPCT again, you know, that's it's all a constant. I just wrote the constant inside and integrated it. Now, because t is the arg max, I can replace t by anything else and it will be smaller. So I replace t inside by f of x, y. So I get this. And then by Holder inequality, this product is less than or equal to the integral of the cube. So I can replace this by this, and that stays the same, and that's A T minus I P F. So it tells you A T minus I P H P C T is greater than or equal to this. It tells you H P C T is less than or equal to I P F. T 
tells you a constant is the optimizer. Okay? Let's stop here.